Hey, I'm Jake, and welcome back to The Gallery. The Gallery is where we house weekly deep dives on all things Startup Studio related. Startup Studios have grown at an incredible rate over the last five years especially, but there's a lot of chatter on the web about how strong the model is, their return profile, how to do it successfully, and so much more. So The Gallery is now here to be the ultra 401 level technical content source for all things Startup Studio GPs, LPs, entrepreneurs, and operators need to know. We do deep dives every week in the form of a podcast, blog, and newsletter. You can subscribe at thegallery.tv. And we also have daily short form content on all of our social media channels. So if you want daily content, but also weekly deep dives, we invite you to subscribe. Without further ado, let's dive into today's episode. I think it's important to know how prestigious Alper is in the studio world. Uh, you've probably heard his name before. His his name and his face are everywhere in the studio conversation. It's it's hard to talk about startup studios these days without uh, putting Alper in that conversation. And um, to give a quick backstory, he and I met probably what uh, five six years ago now, maybe more. Um, we met in the early days of GSSN, Global Startup Studio Network. He was uh, and and still is in the Middle East and saw studios as not only a lucrative project and asset class for himself, but uh, in a, an industry worth bringing to the forefront globally. So really excited to have Alper today. We're going to cover quite a few topics, but let's just get let's just get right into it, my friend. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about Enhance, but also tell us about your role in the global studio community, both as a, uh, a, a general partner, founder of a studio, but also a very active voice in talking about the asset class and the industry as a whole. So I think maybe the best way to summarize that is, first of all, thanks, Jake, for having me. You know, you've been a course and supporter and uh, a comrade, you know, uh, in this journey, right? And I really appreciate that. Um, I've learned from you. I've shared a lot of stories with you. You've introduced me to a lot of people. Hopefully I've done the same. Um, I think the best way to talk about, you know, my journey as a, a studio enthusiast is to talk about, you know, what we do at Enhance because we have really three missions. The first mission is, as a studio, we build ventures for future finance and commerce in the MENAPT region. Right? So this region is very interesting. Um, we, um, we feel we invented the model before we knew it existed um, to meet the challenges of this very fragmented market that we have in the Middle East. And uh, that's our first mission, and that's what I do most of my time day to day. Our second mission is enhanced innovation. Uh, we have a corporate venture building arm that is really um, taking off. And um, we didn't think of this when we first started and hence seven years ago, but in the last two, two and a half years, it has really taken off and there's too much demand, frankly, because the studio model seems to be very interesting tool to apply to corporate innovation needs. But yeah. the third thing is I think maybe more relevant to this conversation and why I have conversations like this is our third mandate, our third mission to um, learn and increase and then you know spread studio knowledge and studio expertise um when, when we met we knew nothing compared to what we know now yeah i hope that what we know now is nothing compared to what we will know let's say five years from now sure and and in that journey um i have been uh, i'm a studio nerd i think that has become a common term among you know, the select group of us that are just, you know, nerding it out and we do a lot of, you know, um, research and analysis of the studio model and try to improve it for ourselves and for the use of others. Yeah. And, um, as that, uh, I'm a very active member of uh, Global Startup Studio Network and um, I sit on the advisory board and I teach the studio bootcamp four times a year together with them. Um, we also hold events. We had one in Dubai, um, Venture Studio Investment Forum back in May. Uh, next week, we're hosting the studio stage at Jitex, the world's largest technology conference here in Dubai. Uh, so we do these things and we try to, you know, publish, you know, uh, things as well. We had a very popular white paper some three, four years ago. We co-authored yep. some papers with JSSN, et cetera, as well. Um, and uh, final thing that I'll say is, like, it's, it's become a life mission. Um, and that I think the need in us to 
push forward with this model and try to improve it and use it comes from a, a place not only as investors and you know people who are trying to create good returns, but also trying to just improve people's lives. We think that entrepreneurship is um, much more difficult than it needs to be. And um, it needs different and better forms of support to succeed better, not only for the investments to generate better multiples, but for the lives to generate better outcomes as well that are involved in it. Sure. The founders, the founders' families, founders' extended families, founders, you know, employees, etc. There's too much misery out there, and we have to try and do better. Yeah. And um, so that's that. That I think that is what motivates us. Um, being a studio founder is not easy. Yeah, it's very difficult. We'll touch on it probably, but um, yeah, when you have that kind of mission of you know, hopefully improving thousands and hundreds of thousands of lives, um, it seems to matter. So let's say I am a wildly sophisticated and successful investor in general, and I am considering becoming an LP in a few venture funds. I'm looking at a few funds. I am. I have a family office of my own, and I am considering maybe investing in some studios. I've heard about studios. I'm hearing some chatter, but it's very polarizing and I don't really know how to make the right assessment here of like what really is a studio in general and then if I do want to get into one like what how do I even assess begin to assess and find the right ones and my first question then would be well, well tell me about this as an asset class past present and future like what has gone on with the studio world over the last what five to ten years where are we at now and then where do we see this going how would you answer this for that sophisticated investor so when this question comes up, you know, what, why an investor should choose a studio versus, let's say, a direct investment into a startup or a venture capital fund, there are a couple of storylines that we follow. Um, one is, uh, do you believe in value of prof professionalization, right? Because what we're trying to do as a venture studio is to make what is Otherwise, in art, it's almost like this mythology of this, you know, mythical uh, founder creating this mythical unicorn is almost artisanal, right? He or she comes in with some magic and knows everything, product, marketing, you know, how to hire, how to raise money, etc. And um, it's quite person dependent that one person, you know, makes it or breaks it, right? And if you look at all the the websites of all the top VC funds, in fact, all the second and third tier VC funds, they all say the same thing, right? That we're looking for exceptional founders, right? And I think to that investor, we say, well, that's all great, but how many perfect founders do you know, right? Um, and um, would you drive, you know, a, a, your car if it was made by a single garage with one mechanic? and its helpers, or do you trust Mercedes-Benz or Tesla to build a very sturdy, amazing vehicle for you? We are that factory. We come and say, let us have a more professional approach to what has been until now in smaller quantity been done in an artisanal way and say, hey, there's a process to this. And building a company can be a professional process driven and uh, learning organization uh, output, you know, um, in itself. So that's one story that we say, right? Like, do you care? Like, if you look at industries out there, every industry that has become a mainstay of, you know, our economies have been professionalized, right? Some have been professionalized over the last 50 years, some 100 years, some has been three, four decades, right? And why can't we professionalize entrepreneurship? So that's one storyline. The other storyline is more saying, hey, you know, um, uh, there's huge risk in early stage venture. And right now that risk is um, greatly taken by investors. Um, and when there's success, the biggest positive outcome is for the founders, right? Okay, that's great. 
Like when there's a, you know, uh, when you find the Google or Facebook and people make hundreds or thousands of X their money, that's great. But for majority of the outcomes that are failures, um, the founder ends up getting some education, right? And in more advanced ecosystems can continue to build the next thing. Whereas the investors are just, you know, have a complete loss. We're saying, hey, can we balance that out? Can we, while we professionalize entrepreneurship, have a different risk and reward balance in that very early stage, the riskiest part of venture? Thus, to an investor coming in, we say, hey, in venture capital, you may have X equity for your million dollars investment in the early stage. Um, what if we, as a venture studio, give you one and a half or two X by having you you know, take that early risk, stage gated, right? And then what if we then, if we are good as a studio, also give you a higher chance of success because we're a learning organization, we have skill sets, we have technologies, we have technology stacks, we have growth hacks, we have networks, we have business capability, et cetera. So that's the other storyline that we, we talk to investors about. Um, and at the end, I think what part of your question was, how do you know what is a good studio? Like where, where should they invest? There, unfortunately, we have to cycle back and come back and, and, and go against my you know, uh, own argument. And we say, I think um, at the end, this professionalization of entrepreneurship relies heavily on the professional that is leading it. So um, the founders of a studio have to have done it before have to have the critical mass capability of, you know, building the, the product team, building the customer team, building the, the company team, mm -hmm. right? And, and being able to raise funding for themselves as a studio, but the ventures and very critically be so good that they can attract talent even better themselves, right? Because the talent does, of course, matter. Um, so I think that still defines what is a great studio. And then, of course, there's the secondary things on, you know, what are they trying to build? Is there a market need for that? Uh, what market are they in? You know, um, what what problem are they solving? For example, is Enhance, we're we're, ge we're a geographic platform. Yes, we do fintech and commerce, but we're also in nine countries across this region. So when you launch with us, we can take you to the second, third, fourth country much faster than you could go by yourself, or sure. you could go even with a venture capital fund, right? Because that it's not their business to launch companies. Like we launch companies. Yeah. Let's talk about the ge geographic part of it. Cause that's a big, that's a big thing here. Why are you doing a geographic play? And, and what do you think is important about that for studios in general? It's very interesting because look, uh, um, the studio model is comparatively better when applied to markets with more friction. Hmm. Um, so I think the Silicon Valley model in Silicon Valley works quite well. The platforms on which we are talking, you know, these devices that we use, um, the, the technologies that change our lives, uh, mostly have come from that model, right? Who am I to argue that Silicon Valley model doesn't work in Silicon Valley? However, when you remove yourself from that reality where there's a lot of capital, a lot of ideas and a lot of talent and a huge market, the press of a button, 350 million people, $21 trillion is at your, you know, um, uh, your fingertips. When you remove yourself from that, suddenly the founders need much more help, right? Funding is more scarce, talent is more scarce, you know, ideas, you know, are, are more difficult to come by, right? There's regulatory issues going from one country to another. There's currency issues. There is country risk, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. The moment you have that, uh, the founders need more help. And who can give that help? The Silicon Valley model fails. Um, the venture capital investors in this region, as brilliant as they are, they're too busy seeing two to 3,000 you know, companies as a deal flow a year. And with their thinner organizations, a lot of their time, majority of their time is spent on that deal flow and their limited capability is there, especially for the smaller earlier stage funds where the fund, where the need is just, you know, very, you know, severe for help. Um, they don't have much time or capability left to support these founders. So another type of organization has to come in and give the 
support where it is needed more. And studios, we think, are it, right? Um, and, and you do see this. Uh, so uh, studios are catching up, uh, catching like, you know, wildfire in this region. Uh, yeah. Not all are full capable and, and not all will survive. Uh, studios have, you know, surf surpassed a number in Europe where entrepreneurship is more difficult and there is fragmentation of the market one way or another mm -hmm. um, versus North America. All of North America combined, US, Mexico, Canada has now less studios than Europe, right? Yep. And it's fastest growing in, in Asia. Uh, again, where uh, markets are fragmented and entrepreneurship is more difficult. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Do you see a world, and I know you've had a, a hand in, I'll rephrase, there was a time where I know you and I were talking about uh, investing in like funds of funds, like studios, investing in many, many studios around the world. Um, to the extent you're able to share, willing to share some of that, would be curious where your head's at on that front now, because I think that's, it's almost like, okay, if I'm going to now invest in a studio and there's going to be a long tail and it's in a place where there's a lot of fragmented entrepreneurship in general, well, why would I invest in one studio? Why wouldn't I invest well, in like the entire region of I, all the studios? I, I, I think, I think it's a brilliant, almost a no brainer move to invest in a series of studios because just diversification theory, right? And sure. China. so um, studios themselves are already diversified. But yep. they're only diversified so much. Our our portfolio is all me mapped, right? Um, but it's diversified, one could argue. But um, I, we still remain very interested in investing in studios. In fact, um, we just announced a fund together with you know Morrow, the JSS mm -hmm. plant company, um, to launch the Global Studio Fund to invest twenty five million dollars into uh, uh, ten to fifteen studios around the world, truly globally. Yep. Um, that's the first fund. Um, uh, we feel that that is going to be the easiest raise we've done. Uh, it'll be easier to raise to that fund than to an individual um, studio. Thus, the need for these funds. Yep. Um, and, and then, if you look at you know, fifteen studios as a collective around the world, you have geographic diversification. You then have portfolio diversification, and you probably have um, since we're not going to concentrate only in one or two sectors, sectoral diversification as well. Yep. And thus you should end, end up having above average returns in venture. And you're yep. investing really early stage, right? Um, there are nuances to it. it. You know, we are one of the first to, you know, try and do this, you know, along with Vault and, you know, now maybe a couple more, you know, such funds are coming. But I think yep. we're going to be quite collaborative and friendly with each other and, and nobody has enough money. There are too many studios fundraising. So sure. we're going to probably co-invest together and um, with a goal of not only providing amazing returns for our investors, but also enabling a lot of these studios to raise more funding and increase their chance of success as well in the process. Yeah. What do you, what do you think needs to happen to educate more investors in general on that this is even existent? <laughs> Let them know this even exists. Yeah. Obviously, like the gallery, for example, being one of the many things that needs to take place just to get the word out more. Um, but like, yeah, you launch a $25 million fund to invest across studios all over the world. There's lots of people with capital burning a hole in their pocket right now, even though it might not seem like it. It's true. They might be like, okay, cool, a studio fund. What's a studio? Yeah. What so, happens there? So first, the good news, right? Uh, compared to when you and I were, you know, met, Right, let's say five yeah. years ago, we are you know it's it's night and dark, right? Uh, 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 night and day, right? Uh, so the studio model as an asset class is so much better known. It's infinitely better understood, even though it's not understood enough, yep. right? And um, the nomenclature is there. Um, we're at that phase where you know um, from a state of unknown. We're now at a state of people thinking that they understand, but at least yep. they've heard about it, right? Yes. Now, a lot yes. of people, I was telling you before we started recording, somebody approached me today on LinkedIn and said, hey, I have this service that your you know, accelerator would really, you know, could benefit from. I'm like, that's, you know, you, you just really <laughs> upset me in the middle of my day. Like, one of the worst things you can do to a studio is to call us an accelerator. Not that I have any yeah, yeah. studios, but we are so different and we've been saying so loudly for so long that we are not accelerators. We are a completely different organization. What we do is very different. 
that um, a lot of people now think that they know what a studio is and that they think it's okay to call it an accelerator, right? Yeah. And even yeah. then I said, we're not an accelerator. He was still saying, hey, for your next cohort, you know, we can use this you know, platform. Like we don't have cohorts, right? I mean, it, it sounds so, like this, this individual just didn't do their research before their cohort so, outreach really think, all it was. I, I think it's still out there. So our challenge still remains. Number one challenge is uh, actually the root cause of this is not, you know, that people are not interested or people are, you know, ignorant. Uh, the root cause is that we as a studio asset class, these studio founders that are raising money that are out there trying to attract you know investors are not telling the story either right or not um congruent enough or like it's just we're, there are too many versions of a studio right we still don't know we call ourselves a venture studio do we call ourselves a venture builder do we call ourselves a startup studio even the nomenclature can you imagine like if accelerators have like three different names right how confusing would that be right um so we need to tell the story better. And there's a lot of effort on that front. Um, yeah. Things like, you know, the studio bootcamp is really helping. I think what you're doing here is going to greatly help. Uh, the events that we're holding, the, the summits, you know, next week at, you know, Dubai or what we ha had, you know, just what, three weeks ago in Denver or what we had in yep. May, these things yep. are helping and like, you know, things are coming to one norm. So that's the first one. Second one is, second challenge is, there are bad actors, right? uh, as with anything, um, and people may not even think of themselves as bad actors. I don't think, you know, serial killers don't think of themselves as bad people often, right? Uh, but there are bad actors. People, you know, call themselves studios either when they are not. Yeah. Right? Um, if you are a software development agency uh, developing software and tomorrow you decide with the same you know organization that you're now a studio so you can charge more for software you are not a studio right um if you're expecting only sweat equity you're not investing cash you're not a studio if you're seven people you're not a studio right if you are um if you don't provide any of these you know like marketing or you know product capabilities or like, you know, some really well-defined admin capabilities, you're not a studio. You have to be a builder to be a studio. So that's one thing that people are saying. People are using the, the name because it became really cool to call yourself a venture builder on your LinkedIn profile and to, to, to turn your XYZ kind of organization into a venture studio because it's we generate enough hype about it, right? Yeah. The other thing is the people who are really studios, but who are you know, um, uh, I call them vulture studios and a few of them came out recently and they really gave us a bad name, like taking 80%, 90%, you know, um, of the cap table, you know, yeah. uh, at the first signature, um, and creating these models that nobody wants to invest in and, and, and having raised large sums of money, you know, and having this, you know, big, you know, like dead man walking portfolio in your hands sure. and then, you know, people writing on wired or tech crunch about it. That's the other thing that has been like negative that we have to watch out for and say, Hey, not everything that calls itself a studio is a studio and not every studio is playing according to the norms, such as the case in every, every type of venture organization, right? There are venture capital funds doing the same. There are accelerators doing the same. There are incubators doing the same. Uh, yep. Right. I mean, uh, but, you know, when you're so nascent and still early stages of being recognized by the, the mass public, these few bad examples can have a very negative effect on the overall, although they are a small minority of the yep. studio. Yep. I mean, even from the beginning, the best performing studios, if we be measure them based off of IRR, TVPI, DPI, whatever real measurement you want to look at, they're the most quiet. Their GPs are not out talking about studios. They're not out producing content very much. They're very much behind the scenes. They don't engage with GSSN. They stay, they stay very private and quiet. Part of it is like they don't want to share their secrets. They don't want to um, open the kimono. Fine. Totally understood. What's your perspective on that? 
and there's a two part question. One is like, well, why are the best ones always so quiet? But then more tactically, if you're launching a new studio and you really believe, well, you're one of the top 1% performers based off your track record and you're going to build a really damn good studio, is it more strategic and beneficial to be quiet or to be loud and engaged with the rest of the community and, and really share your story when you're just getting started? I think, frankly, um, this is a play on... I, it, it, it's There are two factors, right? If somebody's quiet or not and, and uh, when they choose to speak or how involved they are in the studio ecosystem. I think there are, you know, the number one factor is where where are you in your fundraising cycle and how easy is it for you to fundraise, right? Uh, many of these top tier studios that you mentioned without mentioning names can be quite vocal when it comes to fundraising, especially in this environment. Yeah. So we've yep. seen a lot of studios become much more vocal in the last year, year and a half than they were um, earlier. So I think yep. um, it matters, you know, um, how many eyes you want to attract, not only from maybe, let's say, in the US, the examples that you may be thinking of are American examples, but from abroad, then you need to, you know, maybe turn up the volume a bit, right? And we've yeah, seen yeah. that quite considerably in the last year, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Being here in the Middle East where everyone comes to fundraise, um, suddenly people are quite interested in engaging or being on an event or setting up an event here or being on a webinar, et cetera, that we did not see before. And the second factor is, I mean, we do have great studios, you know, in GSSN as well that are quite vocal. And that relies, I think, quite a bit on the founder of that studio and how much they want to give back to the community and their uh, satisfaction or that studio's branding or marketing goals, right? Yeah. Um, I can tell you, uh, TA McCann and Pioneer Square Labs, you know, they're one of the most giving and, you know, most value adding members of GSSM. And yeah. um, that has a lot to do with what a giving and great guy, you know, TA McCann is. Yeah. Um, but in return, PSL is considered to be one of the friendliest, nicest, you know, and best run, you know, studios out there by yeah. the general, you know, ecosystem. And it probably benefits them, right? Sure. And I think, and I think uh, TA and his partners, you know, should be proud of how much influence that they've had in the lives of, you know, um, tens of studios yeah. in the last few More years. More than that. Shout out to TA and the team at Pioneer Square Labs, by the way. It, uh, it's, it's another name that can't be missed here. Um, it's interesting. I, I guess I'd maybe even just chalk it up to like culture. It's it's do you, what yeah. culture do you want? And I think you can take one of two directions there. Um, I'd love to kind of shift gears a little bit in the last 10 minutes or last chapter we, we've got here today. I want to talk about the topic of studios in the context of the VC winter. And for anyone who's listening right now, it's Monday, October 9th, 2023, when we're recording this. And I bring up the date because this weekend alone, this past weekend, I saw quite a bit of chatter out there on, um, we're starting to see things really pick up in the market. Was uh, tech I, market. Think, was tech market. I think you, yeah, there, there was a big tech, I saw you put something out and I saw, I saw quite a few, it's so funny how like one big article makes the rounds and everyone has a new analysis of t today's market. Everything's con everything's conjecture and and posturing, but <laughs> that's a different conversation. Where where do studios fit in right now? Uh, and on that topic, what are some of your predictions of this in the space over the next few years? First of all, uh, on this irrationality of the market, on the way up and on the way down this uh, irrational amplification and the noise that's generated is only dampened by human suffering, right? And I think we have suffered enough. So enough of this down cycle has been dampened. So I, we, we're bound to have um, an upswing. And yes, you know, so like some friends of mine were commenting about the availability of, you know, money, capital, and, you know, the, the interest rates, et cetera. Uh, fine, great. You've been to a lot of macro analysis and, you know, think about economic terms and availability of funding. But, you know, nothing will trump the need for uh, the human spirit, the, the need by the human spirit for innovation, right? 
and um, startups are still the best way that we know how to uh, bring change to how we live. So um, in the context of um, VC Winter, the venture studio model, I think, became easier to sell, right? Mm. Um, because in a way, depending on who's pitching it, implicitly or explicitly, the venture studio uh, founder is pitching for a change. We're saying, you know, we don't necessarily have to replace venture capital. We need venture capital, right? Um, we don't have to replace accelerators or incubators. Like um, they have their place. But we're saying, at least we're saying, we need to be added, right? This is a need for change in the basic makeup of a venture ecosystem, right? Studios have their place. They will be there forever. And it is, you know, an upgrade to the current way that at least some number of early stage ventures are built. And that argument for change, I think, in hindsight, was much more difficult, you know, three years ago when money was falling from the, you know, sky. And, and everybody was just like, you know, dropping, you know, money on whatever the latest type was, you know, uh, Web3 and, you know, et cetera, uh, and crypto. And, um, but now uh, I think there's been re a real soul searching happening. And you can see that soul searching happening uh, by some of the top tier VCs because they should lead, right? They have the means, they have the brand power for change before, you know, a first time fund, you know, uh, manager with a $50 million early stage fund, right? They're not going to be the ones saying, hey, this thing is not working, Liz. So you do, you see it in Sequoia and Axel and Andreessen and, 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 you know, um, they are saying, hey, you know, we should look at how do we more properly support our founders let us have bigger teams, right? And start taking some of the roles on or employ people that are, you know, portfolio companies cannot employ because, you know, uh, this growth hacker or the CTO would rather work for Sequoia than one of our portfolio companies. Or let us launch some studios, right? Um, who was it just recently launched one? The, it was a famous fund. Now I'm drawing a blank, but... Um, so uh, I think we're going to see more of this. I think we're going to um, start seeing studios on one hand raising VC funds as a funding vehicle of their portfolio companies and yep. selectively also investing outside, although I don't necessarily like that model, but our friends in US Atomic and you know, um, High Alpha, PSL, you know, they all do it. And then VC funds, billion, you know, plus dollar big funds coming in and saying, hey, part of this, you know, we're going to dedicate the building from scratch and we're going to build organizations in which we can do that, right? Yep. We're going to start kind of coming into the center because we need more funding and ways of, you know, non-dilutive funding vehicles to build our portfolio. And they need to find ways of supporting, you know, the best outcomes that they get is investing in early stage, those early stage founders. They need to be supported in, in different ways, better ways. And, and the last thing I will say, it's actually like the opening slide of my, um, of my, you know, state of the studio world talk. Um, there is um, like, there's an image of um, a medieval walled city, right? Um, we human beings have come up with amazing economic improvements in the worst of times. During medieval times, we invented a lot of technology around weapons and became very efficient at killing each other. So okay. one way to fight that off was, you know, building these walled cities so that, you know, you could be safe from, you know, trebuchets and cannons and, you know, or just, you know, a, a, a knight with a sword and a, you know, horse. Um, but when you were living in a walled city, it was very difficult to go and do your farming, etc. And people started becoming specialized and the word, custom customer comes from that it became a custom that okay this person was better at making bread and they start becoming more and more a baker and this person was a green grocer because he went out to the fields and collected cucumbers or whatever right so uh the overall economy dramatically improved because everybody became better at what they do and became more efficient 
And there was this amazing economic growth that resulted from that. I think maybe the, you know, if I put my, you know, very optimistic, rosy glasses on, um, I'm hoping this hardship that we've gone through in the last year, year and a half, and this, through this VC winter is going to uh, result in something similar. I think we're going to hopefully learn our lessons, venture capitalist friends, accelerators friends, where I see a lot of them pivoting, and definitely the studio friends saying, you know, hey, okay, you know what? Uh, we have a story that fits and, um, mm -hmm. and we will all end up being in a better place as a result. Totally. I love it. Alper, uh, what's one way that people can get in touch with you and one uh, last like call to action or piece of nugget you want to leave people with in regard um, to thinking about studios these days? So uh, it's uh, one way to get in touch with me is LinkedIn always. Uh, I'm quite active in LinkedIn. So you can find me, um, if you just search my name, A-L-P-E-R-C-E-L-E-M. Um, you can search for my, like, I have a hashtag studio man. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's, you know, uh, what people are, have started calling me. So please reach out on LinkedIn. I'm quite active there and you can follow me. And I try to post on, uh, the, uh, you know, other people's content as well there. And, um, uh, there's a WhatsApp group that I started venture studio exchange. Um, so people can also reach out and I'll, I can try to add them there. And the last piece that I wanted to leave maybe is just uh, this, um, maybe the visualization of what I think is a venture studio. And it's from my, this famous slide that I have. And that's, you know, if venture capital is looking for this Superman or Wonder Woman, you know, as the, this founder that can do it all and that cannot be killed and shoots laser through their eyes. Um, I think as a studio, what we're trying to say is actually, we don't have these perfect, you know, beings. Uh, that cannot be killed and, you know, can kill the bad guys just by a thought. Right? We have these real brave people like Tony Stark, and we try to build Iron Man by having, uh, you know, uh, exoskeleton built around them. Um, I think that's what's needed out there. I think that's what, why the studio model really resonates with founders who know their imperfections. And that's, I think, how we're going to build a more realistic and more successful uh, venture ecosystem out there with the inclusion of studios. Love it. Well, thank you, Alper. It's great to have you on the show, as always. And um, everyone who's listening, definitely follow Studio Man and, uh, and get involved. Hey, thanks, Jake. Always a pleasure.